Uh, thank you, Emilio, for these uh, kind words of introduction. Um, my apologies for not being able to speak Spanish. Uh, it's something I'm working on, but um, it's probably going to take me about 20 years, um, just in time for when I retire to this country. Um, firstly, can, can everyone hear me? Okay, excellent. Um, I will try my best not to speak too quickly, as I, I get prone to do. If I do, just tell me. Okay, this is you know for everyone's benefit. There's no point in me rabbiting on too quickly and no one understanding. Um, okay, so let's have a look at what we're going to cover today. So first of all, a little bit about me, um, who I work for. I'm the managing director of a company called uh, Global Sustainable Trading Limited, Thank you. Uh, which is a part of the Global Sustainable uh, Group Limited companies. Um, the aim of the companies is to provide a range of services to support the design, implementation, and operation of renewable energy uh, and carbon abatement projects. Um, head offices in Boston. We're also in London, uh, Izmir in Turkey, Vancouver, and Paris. Um, our background is as a project developer um, and certifier of Turkish Gold Standard projects. Um, but we're now looking to invest in projects, trade our own credits, um, and add value that way. I thought we'd start with a little joke. Okay, this is my way of, again, not being able to speak Spanish, so... <laughs> I won't read it out for you because I'll just murder it, but if you just want to have that, and then kindly laugh at the end, I'll feel better. <laughs> I do like those. I've got some good news, but I've got some bad news ones. So, okay. so on to work. So, really, this is what I want to cover today. Um, introduction, you know, definitions, uh, which we'll go to in just a moment. We'll look at some historic data in terms of uh, volumes and, and pricing data in the voluntary carbon markets over the recent years. Um, the components of what makes a VR offset. Uh, we'll look at some pricing, current pricing of VRs, um, tips on how to transact VRs and sort of common hurdles. Uh, we'll look at the voluntary carbon market, the VCM, uh, versus the regulated emissions market. Not, not in any great depth, but just as a, you know, a nice comparison. Um, and then I'd like to finish off looking at the future and some potential scenarios, what-if scenarios that may or may not happen in the near future. Um, in terms of the format, if you want to save your questions to the end, Sit down, I'll have a glass of water, and we can, uh, we can do the questions, okay? Alternatively, if people want to speak to me after, during lunch, whatever, just come, feel free to come up to me, um, and uh, I'm happy to try and answer any questions you may have. Okay, now, in, in my presentation, I've taken um, several slides from... Uh, with, with the kind permission of Ecosystem Marketplace and Bloomberg New Energy Finance. The reason I've done that is, A, they're really cool, um, and B, this is really... The voluntary market is, is reasonably opaque. There's not a lot of published data on it. Um, I'd suggest that this report is probably the best single report available on the market, um, and, uh, and so it's, it's kind of the Bible. Everyone refers to it. Um, they take the data from about 600 direct respondents, uh, you know, brokers, traders, project developers. So pretty much everyone involved in the voluntary carbon market has an input, gives their, their data anonymously but freely to this survey that happens every year. Um, and I'd say if anyone is, is, is serious about the voluntary carbon market, you know, definitely get a look at this. Um, and so it comes out every year. Uh, the website, www.ecosystemmarketplace.com. Okay, um, you download it for free, but it's, it's an absolutely brilliant document, um, as, as you'll see from the, uh, the, the slides that I'm going to be uh, using from it. Okay, so just a thank you to those guys. Okay, so let's start with some definitions. You know, firstly, does, who knows here what the VCM is or, or what VRs are? You know, when we throw these terms about, do people have some experience of those? Not really? Okay, great. We've got the definitions. So, really, the first one is talking about the voluntary carbon market, which I'll, I'll keep calling the VCM for brevity, okay? So, this is from National Renewable Energy Lab, and if you just read it, that's, that's what it's all about, okay? And the second one is a VR definition, and that's from the Financial Times. Um, that's the guide they give to their journalists, so that's their definition of what a VR is, okay? 
So carbon credits are not certified by the UN under the, the Kyoto Protocol. Some companies and individuals choose to buy the credits resulting from carbon pro uh, projects that are not certified by the UN in order to meet their own carbon reduction objectives, okay? So really on the first point, it's a volunteered action, okay? So it's not required by regulation or legislation. Um, so that's an important distinction compared to the regulated markets. On the second point, the VR definition, um, VRs aren't issued by the UN. Um, in fact, they're issued by lots of different bodies, um, and there's lots of different types of VRs. There's not one generic type and one issuing body, unlike the UN and CR, for example. Okay? But all of them share the same essential characteristics, uh, namely the reduction of emissions from specified projects that wouldn't have occurred um, were it not for the carbon credit finance. And again, this theme of, of additionality um, is important to both the voluntary market and the regulated market in terms of offsets. Okay, and, and additionally, all these credits are measured in tons of carbon dioxide equivalent. Okay, so that, that's the, the common unit of measurement for all types of VR. Okay, so let's look at some historic data of the market to really set the scene of where we are. This first slide, um, we're looking at volume, so the amount of tons traded. Okay, so you know, as, as you can see, um, firstly, the VCM, it's not a new market. Okay, you know, we can see data from before 2002. This, this hasn't happened overnight. This has been going for a while. Okay, and we can, we can look at some patterns here. Um, you know, and really what we can see on that chart is after years of sustained growth, um, transaction volumes declined by about 26% in 2009. So they really fell off a cliff. Okay, and there's, there's reasons for that. Um, another important point I want to talk about is uh, the sort of definitions here, OTC, CCX, exchanges, um, and you can see the makeup of these stats, okay? CCX, in this case, refers to the Chicago Climate Exchange, okay, um, which uh, is, is a voluntary mandatory scheme. So mainly American, a few hundred mainly American companies have decided to voluntarily adopt uh, a cap-and-trade scheme um, and to, to cap their emissions. Uh, they use credits called CFIs, um, and the, the volumes registered on the CCX make up, as you can see, the, the, the light blue volumes, okay? The, the CCX exchange now is, as we can see, this is 2008, 2009 data. CCX scheme actually finished at the end of last year. So there are some companies still trading and, and still buying some CFIs, but pretty much that market is over. So I think moving forward, and if we see the, you know, the ne next year's data from 2010, 2011, um, there's not going to be much CCX, I don't think. Um, but I, I mention it just to make that distinction. Um, exchanges, there are a few exchanges um, where people can transact VRs, um, and there seems to be, you know, a, f a few more, um, it seems to be gaining traction. But um, as, as we can see, you know, it's, it's not really in the same league as uh, OTC and CCX. So that leaves OTC over the counter. So these are bilateral trades as opposed to on an exchange like the CCX, okay? Um, and that really is the the majority of the market, more or less. And I think that, that's really the, the, the focus of the market as well, I, I'd suggest. Um, you know, over-the-counter trading is, is bilateral, um, and there are actually some OTC CCX trades, but not a great deal. Um, okay, so we can see that OTC has been the dominant avenue until 2008, um, but it's, it's now resuming its dominance. This really re reflects a largely unstructured nature of the VCM. Um, where trades are typically bespoke transactions between two counterparties. Because VRs are so different, it's very hard to commoditize them. So typically people want to know exactly what they're buying, um, and they want to buy a, you know, a, a unique uh, volume, a unique vintage, etc. So some points that we'll touch on a little bit later. Okay? The, one, of, one of the big reasons, obviously, for the drop-off is the global economic recession. Okay? The vast majority of OTC purchasing uh, is done for a, a pure voluntary, for a retirement basis. So people are buying these tons voluntarily, they don't have to, with a view to retiring them um, and offsetting their emissions. Obviously, when you have a bigger recession, companies have less money, um, the belts are a bit tightened, so they stop doing this. So we can just see that, that direct cut. You know, you'll notice that, um, you know, that shrinkage there. Uh, as I said, OTC is slightly different because you had companies who signed up voluntarily to do to join a certain scheme, so that had to run its course. Okay, so that was uh, affected, but but not in such a, a similar fashion. So now let's look at okay value. So the last one was volume in terms of tons transacted, same sort of parameters, but now it's value. 
in the market, okay? So the aggregate of, of the prices of all these different trades. And again, you know, we can see the market's been going for a while. Um, small market growing, 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 you know, growing quite nicely, really. Um, and again, that same drop off, okay? Again, because of the recession. Um, and you know, that, that, that's global, that's affecting everyone. Taking this time. So values of credits have similarly declined during the, the, the following years. Um, average OTC prices. Yeah. Uh, declined um, to about six and a half dollars a ton to produce a three hundred and twenty six million dollar market, as you can see. Um, and that constitutes 87% you know, of the total. So again, OCC really showing that's kind of the, the, the recent sort of uh, direction of the market. You know, note also the value of CCX credits dropping from $307 million to 50 million. So we, we saw on the last slide there was a, a slight reduction in, in tons, but uh, you know, that's a massive reduction in value. Obviously the price of C, CFI, the CCX credits, kind of went through the floor. So you get that, that massive drop off in price. You know, so overall, there's a picture of a, of a shock decrease in volumes of transacted VRs and also in their value. Um, 2009 was a bad year. Okay, so let's look more specifically over the key trends of 2009 and early 2010. Um, 2009 started strongly, ended quietly, as we said, because of the recession, primarily. Uh, linkages between infrastructure providers and third-party standards, uh, also expansion to new locations and emerging markets for supply and demand. So that was, that was a key trend we saw in 2009. This theme of building up infrastructure, registries, platforms, people ready to trade when the market picks up again. Um, better information for buyers due to transparency of issuances, registries, pricing, reports, etc. Um, also improved knowledge and experience of counterparties. You know, I've said people have been trading credits for, for a while, but really in, in any decent volume, only in the past few years. So with that, you get more experience between counterparties. Uh, deals are, are, are a lot smoother. People know what to expect. So that, that helps as well, allied to the fact of better information generally, uh, more transparent pricing, et cetera, in the market. So kind of moving into a bit of a more mature market. Um, the fourth point there, uh, CSR, uh, corporate social responsibility. Um, and public relations were reported as the main buyer motivations. Um, Pre-compliance activity also scaled up as a major market influence. Okay. Um, and the last one, you know, consumers increasingly are seeking specific um, options. For example, uh, a, a VR credit with VCS standard and also CCB for certain applications. So buyers are getting very picky in terms of what standards they want, and we're seeing that um, interest and demand from buyers, you know, increasing all the time. So again, that was a very big trend um, lastly and still to this day. Um, you know, the, the, the issue is no one wants to be left holding credits that are subsequently deemed to be from a poor standard. And, and because there isn't a UN or one governing body saying, this is a good standard, that's a bad standard, um, everyone has to take a kind of gamble. So everyone sort of looks at each other and works out what they think are the best standards for that type of project type. Okay. Um, and obviously, sellers are very responsive to buyers' preferences. If a buyer only wants to buy a certain type of standard, sellers will then start making their credits um, that standard applicable. Okay, so next we're going to go through a few slides looking at the components of a VER offset. Okay, um, and as we can see, these include you know standard, uh, the project type or methodology, uh, the location, you know where the project's taken place. Um, and also the vintage, the year in which the offset emissions occurred. You know, as we've seen, a VR is a bespoke credit um, and a sort of commoditized instrument, at least not yet. Um, therefore, the many factors that, that comprise a VR, um, and later on we'll see this illustrated in pricing preferences as well. So let's look at the main ones. How's that come out? Okay, it's a little bit small. Um, really what you have, if you can't see it at the back, is a list of various standards, American Carbon Registry Standard, Carbon fix, you know, climate action reserve. Got to find this for Jerry. Voluntary carbon standard. There you go. Keep everyone happy. Um, so a list of standards um, and just a description. I'm sorry you can't read that, but uh, it's just it's just a nice, nice neat. If you if you take away the notes, it, it'll be quite a useful slide because it gives you a lot of information on popular standards and the slight differences. Okay. Okay. So. 
the point of the slide is there's lots of different standards out there. We're, we're nowhere near commoditized at the moment. And that's a moving feast as well. There's new standards coming, other standards kind of dying off. But again, it's a buyer's market, really. So what the buyers want, they get. OK, so this, this is an important slide. Um, this is showing uh, the most popular standards by tons transacted, um, at least in 2008 and 2009. Um, and we can see in that time frame, clearly, the most popular standards of ECS, CAR, CCX, and gold standard. And obviously, it decreases down. And you can see the difference as well between 08 and 09. Okay. Um, though CCX activity has largely stopped following the end of the compliance period last December, um, just before it finished, on December 22nd, there was an enormous trade done. 59.1 uh, million tonnes were transacted, uh, which is the biggest trade in the history of the voluntary carbon market. Um, so on its own, that was, that was bigger than the entire volume of CCX transacted in the whole of 2009, just from one trade. Um, someone just came in and vacuumed up pretty much all the credits. Um, but we can't get too excited because the price of the credits transacted was uh, just under two cents a ton. So 59 million tons, it was about $10,000, I think. No one knows who it was. My view is it's probably just a speculator chancing the wrong $10,000. They might be worth something, they might not. But uh, that'll certainly affect the data when we look at this next year in terms of, uh, of uh, CCX versus uh, OTC. Okay, so we can see, you know, the main standards, the popular standards, in effect. Okay, now we're going to look at transaction volume by project type. Again, 08 versus 09. So we can look at all the different types of uh, offset projects. Landfill, afforestation, reforestation, wind, hydro, etc. Um, project type is another really important component of a VER, and certainly the, the popularity or the demand for a VER. Uh, as we can see, landfill gas was the major winner, capturing uh, about a seventh of the volume, with forestry and wind kind of a, a distant second, really. Um, you know, landfill gas is popular in America, and America is, is a, the home of a lot of buyers, so if they like landfill gas, it bumps up the averages. Um, and, and additionally, there's lots of landfill gas projects globally in, in, in the poorest countries, you know, municipal um, rubbish dumps, that sort of thing. So, you know, flaring methane from, from landfill gas sites. So it's a very accessible, a very popular type of credit around the world. Um, and, you know, in particular, Americans quite like buying landfill. So that, that sort of partly explains the, the popularity. It's interesting to, to also see the transacted volumes of hydro much lower in uh, 2009 than they were in 2008. And again, the reason for that is there's been a, a, a shift in preferences from buyers. Um, hydro, renewable energy, you know, voluntary buyers like renewable energy projects typically. But there's kind of a glut of hydro projects on the market. So people, you know, don't want to have their portfolios just full of hydro. So it's really fallen off. Um, and, and additionally, there's a lot of large hydro projects, and people now prefer micro hydro projects, um, run of river, you know, less damage to the, the ecosystem of the river, et cetera. So, you know, that, that's kind of a, a glaring change from 16.4 you know, to 3.2. So, you know, hydro is, is definitely not uh, in fashion at the moment. Okay. So, we looked at standards, projects. Just a, a quick aside into uh, what's a really fast-growing area of the market, land-based credits. Okay? Um, you know, the, the popularity of land-based credits, forestry-type credits, really seems to have gone full circle. <clears throat> you know, a, a lot of companies in the voluntary market started out doing forestry. People identify with trees. Um, you know, saving uh, forests or, or planting forests as well was, was very popular. Um, and then I, it, it seemed to fall out of favor, and there are, there are issues over, you know, additionality, buffers, what, how can you guarantee forest doesn't get chopped down, um, the, the logging just goes to the, the next door forest, all those issues, which, which are now being um, tackled again, and we're seeing the sort of full circle of people now engaging again with forestry, with, with red-type projects as well. Um, you know, afforestation, reforestation, planting forests where it's not been before, or, or replanting where, where it once was and chopped down. Um, you know, and a, a big area, I, I think, is going to be red which is this uh, avoided deforestation. I think people really strongly identify with that. 
Um, and it's also an excellent example of the innovation of the voluntary carbon market com compared to, say, the regulated markets, where, in this case, the voluntary standard, the voluntary carbon standard, in, in fact, has developed a robust and coherent project methodology that the UN is now looking at emulating and making uh, available for its projects. So, you know, that's a nice little footnote in terms of one of the values of the voluntary market. It's not just about people wanting to feel good about themselves and offsetting their flights or their company's emissions. Um, it's also a driver for innovation in terms of project types. Um, and that's very valuable. So, transaction volume by project location. So again, this is another one of those vital components, standard, project type, location as well. You know, it's a buyer's market. People are interested where the credits came from, um, and that'll affect the price, that'll affect the demand. So as we can see, again, because we're aggregating you know, lots of data in this report, uh, the US is, is the most popular. Um, by a, a long way. Again, that's because there's a lot of American buyers and Americans like buying American. So that's, that's going to make it look like that. Um, you know, outside of America, um, I'd suggest that people quite like buying um, credits from least developed countries. Okay? It used to be China, India. Now people have got kind of a, a surplus of that. So they're looking at um, you know, Ecuador or Tibet or places like that. It's, some of it is you know, kind of fashionable. Um, but people typically want to feel that they're investing their money in a project that's really helping the community, wherever that is. Um, and the smaller, the most, f you know, furthest away um, and uh, uh, exotic it sounds, uh, tends to be quite popular. Mm. Okay. So, this is just, uh, I think, quite a cool slide. Doesn't, doesn't show a great deal. Transaction volume by location and project type. Um, as you can see, um, you know, volumes, where are these coming from? You know, America, as we've seen in the last slide, very popular. Africa, increasingly. Um, Australia. So this is where you know, locations of projects are, are typically coming from. Okay. Central America, South America as well. Okay. And again, same sort of thing, but you get a, a look at volumes as well. So obviously America, a lot of projects going on over there. South America. Uh, you know, India is very popular. China do a lot of projects. Okay. So now let's look at transaction volume by vintage. So again, on this theme of components, um, standards, you know, location, vintage as well um, is very important. So what year did the uh, the offsets take place in? Um, and as we can see. Uh, this is 2008-2009. The most popular offsets in 2009 were from 2009, so the freshest ones available. People weren't that interested in uh, offsets that happened five years previously. Equally, they weren't massively interested in, in offsets that are going to happen in a few years' time. Um, so it's very much a spot market, um, and that's not changed a huge amount you know, last year either. Um, so people like buying spot, people like buying fresh. If you have the choice as a buyer to buy an offset that occurred last week or one that occurred four years ago, you're probably going to go with the freshest. Okay. So that sort of concludes the, the components of a VR. Yeah, pricing, it's, it's depressing, but um, you know, hopefully things are on the mend. So we're going to look sort of briefly at pricing now and sort of factors affecting it. So this is just a, a neat slide showing credit price by project type, 2008-2009. Um, no surprise, you know, the most um, extreme, you know, impressive uh, project methodologies attract the highest price. Uh, I said before, renewable energy is popular with people, uh, you know, solar. I don't think there's a lot of solar projects out there, but um, they're super duper. Uh, yes, yes, yep, yep. Um, you know, biomass as well, you know, typically in a, you know, in a village, uh, Situation, you know, bagasse from sugarcane or you know waste pulp, that sort of thing. Um, Co-firing burners with uh, you know waste products. So biomass is very important. Um, energy efficiency, wind again, as well, renewable people like that. You know, well, what's what's getting sort of less price? Uh, we're looking at things like industrial gas, geo sequestration. You know, it's all on a massive scale. People, you know, it's it's an industrial factory burning, uh, incinerating industrial gases. You know, it's not very sexy. It doesn't really get the, the, the heart pumping, whereas some you know, fantastic solar project is brilliant or you know, 
a small run of river hydro project in the Andes, you know, people, people go for, okay? Factory stuff, less cool, smaller price, okay? Okay, and here's a slide I've taken from a publication called Environmental Finance. Um, again, if you're interested in the voluntary market, I'd recommend you have a look at it. The reason I put it in is just to show an example of how information is being disseminated in the market now. Um, this wasn't the case three years ago when pretty much brokers and traders were the only ones who really knew what credits were worth because they were the ones transacting them. So it was very much a bit of a you know, dark art and you know, no one really knew what prices were. You know, I'd contest that, as we'll see, you know, prices and spreads are still reasonably wide, um, which would suggest to me that there's not a great deal of, of activity um, you know, at that moment in time for those credits. Um, you know, 50 cents to $3.25, that's a pretty wide spread. Um, but as you can see here, this, this comes from a monthly publication. They take turns, there's a brokerage, Evolution, they take turns with, with Evolution, other brokers. I did this for six months, giving prices. Um, and it's just a good example of how pricing is, is disseminated in, in the market. Um, but as well as pricing, well, firstly, you look at really what's most popular. This is what people want to see. So VCS, again, very popular standard. So people want to see pricing for types of VCS credits. Gold standard. Um, ARB, this, this is the Californian market, which um, is due to start uh, at the beginning of next year. So there, there's uh, interest already in pre-compliance buyers, people you know, willing to buy these credits because they think they'll be able to use them next year. Um, and there's different types of these credits based on the likelihood of them being able to use them. So again, a difference in price, you know, 325 for that CRT against you know, 925 for that one, okay? Um, but apart from pricing, this is also a good slide because it shows um, and I've asked them to change this. It's not really about voluntary offset registries. Um, it's about standards. And what we're looking at is the popularity of standards. And again, this is published monthly. Um, so we're looking at projects registered to date. You know, VCS 555, you know, that's, that's a popular standard. Sellers have been told that there are buyers for VCS. They really focus on that one. Um, you know, gold standard, quite popular as well. CAR in California, it's getting more popular because of this potential market in the American Carbon Registry. But I just thought that was a, you know, a, a neat sort of highlight there of what's going on. Issued credits as well, you know, 50 million, 51 million. That kind of says a, a big story about what people want to buy in the market. Okay. So now I just have a, a sort of a quick look at, at transacting VRs. We've talked about what a VR is, what the voluntary carbon market is. But let, let's have a look at, you know, who, who's transacting them and, uh, and things to think about. So, you know, the first thing to remember with a VR is they're not commoditized. You know, one VR is not the same as another VR. As we've seen, they completely vary on location, vintage, standard, um, project methodology. So there's lots of different components. So it's not comparing eggs with eggs at all, okay? Equally, there are no guarantees of enduring appeal. You know, what was really popular, as we saw a couple of years ago, large hydro, um, people had enough of it. So... What was popular becomes unpopular. It's very fashionable. And because, because it's not a commodity, no one really knows what's going to happen. So buyers tend to buy what they think is the best um, and, and hold on to that or, or retire the credits. So there's an element of, of, of fashion, of changing fashions. There's lots of different choice. Um, beauty is very much in the eye of the beholder. Um, certain people think certain standards, certain project methodologies are the bee's knees. Other people buy completely separate things. Um, you know, if you look at it on an international level, Americans tend to buy um, project types that Europeans find a little bit, you know, un unsexy. Landfill, you know, Europeans aren't really interested in landfill. It's a bit older. Europeans want, you know, as I said, you know, Ecuadorian solar systems or something like that. Whereas Americans just want landfill, you know. So it really depends who the buyer is. Um, and again, there's potential for interference from external agencies. You know, credits go through a process of being verified, validated, typically by third-party companies, registry companies, um, and verification companies. Sometimes they can have too much work on. Um, there's a constant complaint they haven't got enough staff. A lot of projects um, are CDM projects, and so they get verified by the CDM verifier, but they're also, you know, they'll count the credits before the UN registration as VRs. Now, if there's a problem, for example, the UN suspends the verifier, then the knock-on effect is the VRs don't get verified either because no one can do anything until that verifier is released from its suspension. So th there's all these you know, various impacts potentially on, uh, on issuing these credits and you know, transacting VRs. It's all very well doing a contract to you know, take ownership of co uh, VRs from next month, but then if there's a six-month delay, you know, th there's, a, there's an issue. 
There's also this legislative uncertainty as well. You know, who knows what politicians are going to think of next in terms of what's permissible, what isn't permissible. Some credits might become eligible for a compliance scheme in the future. So, you know, that you know, massively changes the dynamic of those credits. As we saw with those CRT, those Californian credits, a lot of people think there's going to be a market starting um, next year. Suddenly the demand for certain types of CRTs goes through the roof because people are buying them now before they become more expensive. You know, the legislation might, might fall apart. It might not start next year, and then we'll see prices probably drop down again. So, you know, there's all these impacts, these unknowns. Um, and, you know, occasionally there is some bad press. Um, I think less and less, though. You know, four or five years ago, there's always stories in newspapers about, you know, anyway, tons, Mickey Mouse credits, that sort of thing. I mean, I, th I think we're pretty much over that now. Um, and even the voluntary market, it's, it's not officially regulated. Um, there's, there's a great deal of transparency, robustness, you know, third-party registries, uh, transparent data being viewed. Um, so I think we're going to see a lot less of that, but you do get it occasionally. Um, and that can, you know, I put it in there because that can maybe knock an end user. Well, actually, I'm not going to buy these credits now because I read something in the paper the day and I'm not sure they really exist. So, you know, you have those impacts as well. So all in all, it's pretty hard work, okay? It's not like trading crude oil where everyone knows what it is. Okay, so who are the buyers? We've covered VRs, components of VRs, some pricing, what's hot, what's not. But, you know, who are these people? And, you know, we've got a nice little summary of, of the various guys. So business for profit. So as opposed to, you know, NGOs or governments, the, these are businesses that typically want to buy offsets to retire them. They want to offset their emissions. They're going to buy VRs. They think it's, it's the right thing to do. They want to do that. So they're the majority of, of buyers. That's their motivation, Okay. But also, there's a lot of people buying for profit. So I'm going to buy these credits, and I'm going to sell them to that guy, make a bit of money, because I think they're going to go up in value. So, which is healthy. That's part of a, you know, a good market. So we're seeing more of that as well. It's not just people buying a credit, retiring it. Um, additionally, you know, business for profit, so pre-compliance end use, particularly in America, people buying credits because they think um, they're going to need them in a couple of years when legislation changes. Um, or they're going to buy them now because they think they're going to be worth a lot more in the future. So get in, get in quickly, get in cheap. Okay. And uh, here's a slide from our friends at Market. That's in there. Thank you for that one. Um, and it, again, it's a lot of information on one slide, but but I put it in there because I think it's very useful. It really shows that the various stages. Um, that a credit will go through, so amongst other things, um, as well as all the wonderful things that the market uh, registry system can offer the products. But you know, if we look here, you know, from a, a project going from project design, so someone writing on a piece of paper what they think the project should be, a wind farm, for example, then going through project validation, so being, you know, bit built and then tested, project operation, actually turning it on, making the the, the project work, verification, and then you know we can see that the people typically involved in the next stage. Projects up and running, it's generating credits. What happens next? Okay, there's traders, there's brokers, there's investors getting involved. Okay, people buying credits, people brokering credits. So that's the next stage: clearing houses, settlement. Okay, and then buyers, as we saw on the previous um, slide, corporate buyers. You know, looking to uh, retire them. Retailers, offset retailers. You know, we'll go into a, a firm, um, do a carbon audit, measure that company's carbon footprint, educate that company on how to use less carbon, and then finally offset what they can't reduce themselves. So those guys are involved. Um, speculative buyers, as I said in America, people buying credits now because I think they could be worth more in the future, as opposed to retiring them. So you know, lots of different market participants. You know, a few stages for a project to actually go through, um, and you know, the people who get involved in the middle typically. Okay. And here's just a quick picture of transaction volume by registry utilized as well. We've talked about VR components, we've talked about pricing. Um, there's lots of different registries out there. You know, APX, VCS, CAR, CCX, Case Depot. So there's a lot of choice as well in this market. You can buy your credits and you can put them on your APX account. You can put them in your market account. Um, you can move them freely between market to APX if you like. Um, Again, this is an important distinction for the market. Because the market is a bit more grown up now, we, we have this, this facility, this infrastructure in place. I can go onto market, and I can look at a project that someone wants to sell me. I can look at all the, the project documents. I can make sure it's real. I can see verification reports. Um, providing the seller wants me to see that, I can do that. Everyone can do that if it's in the public view. Um, and that's great, because you know, in the past, it was very much... You know, if I'd be broking a deal, I'd say, well, you know, trust me, these credits do exist. They have been verified. I haven't got the document yet, but, you know, it's good. Whereas now, 
you know, pretty much once they're on an exchange, they've been issued. So there's no, um, there's no project risk. You know, well, what if the project doesn't finish or if the investment doesn't happen? You know, it's done, it's there, it's been issued, certified, bang, that many tons. Um, and you know, as you can see, there's lots of places to do that, lots of different registries. So I see that as being quite healthy in the market. Okay, so just to sort of conclude on this section, look at some quick tips for sellers and buyers for VR transactions. You know, I won't read through them all, but you know, for, for a seller, it's really important to choose the right standard. What's a buyer going to buy? There's no point going down, you know, paying money for your credits to be verified to a standard that no one has any interest in, because who's going to buy it? Okay. Um, you know, do understand what you're selling. Have all the info, as I said, in the registry account so people can see it. It's a genuine project. The tons exist. You know, it's all above board. Okay. From a, a transaction side, you know, please commit to sell. You know, in the past, there's been so many people who dangle credits out. They get me some prices. Let's do a deal. Uh, actually, I think the market's going to go up. I'll withdraw them. You know, that just annoys everybody in the market and gives you a bad name. And I've been involved in a lot of that. Um, you know, speak, speak to experts. You know, get, get the advice. Do it properly, okay, if you're a seller. This is an investment. You're going to make some money out of this. So it pays to, to do it professionally. Don't cut corners. Um, and certainly in terms of price, be realistic. You know, as we've seen, prices go up, prices go down. It's very fashionable what people want to buy, what people don't want to buy. You know, you'll have a better chance of selling stuff if you're realistic in price and you've met all the conditions, okay? Equally, from a buyer's perspective, Really work out exactly what you want. You know, if you're, if you're going to go into this process of transacting VR credits, at the outset, know what it is you want. You know, don't suddenly change volumes, vintages, you know, locations, because again, it's just a massive pain. Um, understand a little bit about the market. You know, find out you know what a good standard is for your requirements, what a bad standard is. Um, you know, commit to buy. Speak to experts. You know, sometimes accept unforeseen delays, as we've seen. Th you know, things happen in this market um, out of the, the control of a lot of people. So, you know, again, be realistic, accept that, okay? And I'd say at the bottom, you know, from a, a business perspective, for both counterparties always aim for repeat business, you know? It's, it's so much easier, you know, and, and we see more and more of this in the market now of you know, these bilateral transactions, you know, company A dealing with company B for specific credits from a specific project. Once you've done the first deal and the first contract, then there's a lot of trust there. And it saves so much time. Next time, you know, the buyer wants credits, go back to the same guy. You know, you've got the contract in place, the trust. You know they've sent the, credit, the credits over. So, you know, that, that's, a, that's a shrewd thing to do, if you possibly can. Okay. So, now it's going to have a, a quick comparison of the regulated emissions market against the VCM. Anybody guess which market this one is? Yeah, that's the VCM. Uh, kind of says it all, really. Okay. Again, you know, big table, lots of data, but, um, you know, the important bits are voluntary markets here, okay, regulated markets here. Scores in the doors. As we've seen previously, 09 was less um, in terms of volumes and pricing than, than 08, but let's look at the, the you know, the, the size. 2009, voluntary markets traded 94 million tons, okay. We saw the the prices go up and up in the values. Um, you know, it slumped again in 2009 because of the recession, because of this drop-off in value and also transacted tons. Okay, so it was only worth 387 million out of 143 billion um, uh, in 2009. But, you know, let's not get too disheartened by it. Um, but that's just, I just think that really puts it into context. The EU ETS, you know, $118 billion last year. That's a pretty big market, okay? But that's a regulated market. People have to do it. It's a law, okay? $387 million, That's people just willingly doing it, okay? So big, big distinction. But uh, obviously, we're very much the small dog compared to the big dog. So let's look at the future now. Um, I'm doing for time. Again, with this market, who knows? You know, it's really up to people's own interpretations. You know, we've got the old... Half, half, uh, glass half full, glass half empty view of it, really. Um, depends if you're an optimist or a pessimist. You know, this is an interesting one. This is the survey that Ecosystem Marketplace and Bloomberg New Energy Finance do. They always throw this question just at the end. And they say, you guys are market you know, experts. You're participating in this market. Where do you see the market going next year, five years, ten years' time? Okay. And you know, what we can see, well, it, what we can see is... Uh, now, that's the real, actual line of what's happened, historic growth, okay? 2007, people thought the market was going to dip a bit and then go up. 
actually pretty accurate. You know, look what they've got to 2000. So 2007, they actually accurately predicted the size of the market in 2009. That's pretty cool. So, you know, what this really demonstrates is people aren't running away with themselves. There's not people saying, yeah, you know, this year was quiet, but next year we're going to do a gazillion tons. People are quite rational, um, and they're not too far off the mark, really. Um, I've just filled in this survey for this year, and again, you know, uh, I'm reasonably optimistic about what the market will hold. But uh, so there we see what, you know, 599 other people in the market, their view of the projected growth and direction of this market is. It's up. People think we're going to recover from the recession and it's going to go back to that sustained upward trend. So just finally, I want to look at likely scenarios that I think may happen, probably. Um, as I said, I, I think we'll see a bounce back um, to upward growth in, in the global voluntary carbon markets. You know, as I said a few times, the OTC market is largely um, occupied with retirement, with, with pure voluntary aspirations as opposed to pre-compliance. Uh, I think the recession took a lot of money out of the system. People um, tightened their belts a bit. When the recession's uh, effects end, people, you know, have, companies have a bit more money than individuals, I think we'll see that trend going up again. People will start um, buying offsets again, and we'll see that growth continue. Um, I think we're going to see continued evolution of standards in the market. You know, buyers are still very picky. They, they want standards that really reflect what uh, the, the sort of projects they want to buy. Um, and increased market transparency. Um, you know, as we've seen already, there's, there's been a huge amount of transparency in terms of registries, freely available pricing data, et cetera, et cetera. A few years ago, we really didn't have any of that. It was all whispers and, and, and very sort of uh, dark arts. Um, I, I definitely personally believe in, in red projects. I think that's going to be a massive sector um, in the voluntary market for, for the reason that people identify with trees and forests, you know. Um, and additionally, um, especially with, with red projects, you know, avoided deforestation, all, all the sort of biodiversity benefits as well. It's not just chopping the tree down. It's, you know, the animals that live in the forest. It, it's the whole interconnection. And I think people are, are getting into that in a bigger way now. People will be happy to, if they invest in an offset, as opposed to, you know, a large hydro project and a concrete dam in China, I think more and more people will be interested in actually investing in offset that, that are saving, you know, the canopy of some Amazonian jungle, for example, for, for lots of different reasons. Um, and I think also we're going to see more African projects. Um, buyers for a long time have been, um, I think, quite unhappy by the, by the dearth, by the shortage of projects in Africa. The reality, it's a very difficult place to do business. It's very difficult, you know, apart from North Africa, South Africa, it, it's improving, but the, the hurdles that developers go through to get projects made um, in Africa are, are numerous and, and very high, but we're starting to see more flow. Uh, and again, people, certainly Europeans, who are buying, you know, OTC credits for the, the pure voluntary, you know, if they can help a community in Africa as opposed to a community in, you know, a, a slightly richer part of the world, they'll probably prefer the African option. Again, it chimes with a lot of people, like forestry does as well. So I think we'll definitely see that. Um, more innovation. You know, as we saw, RED is actually a voluntary carbon innovation anyway. It's not copied from the CDM. It started in the voluntary market. I think we're going to see more of those innovations as well. Um, you know, something that's very hot and popular at the moment are improved cook stoves. So small African villages are given um, these cook stoves. They use less fuel, so they're more efficient. Um, and there's various knock-on effects. You know, typically the children don't have to spend you know, hours each day walking further and further to chop down firewood. So they're using less firewood. They're spending less time collecting it. Um, there's less you know, respiratory illnesses because they, they, they burn cleaner, so there's less smoke. The children have more time, so they can get education. So there's lots of knock-on effects as well. Um, again, you know, water filters is a great system, as opposed to having to heat the water to purify it. Inexpensive filters now, which, which can be given out in a project. Um, and again, that, that has health benefits, you know, time benefits, education benefits. So we're going to see more of these you know, quite clever, innovative ideas in, in voluntary projects. Um, and, and I think that'll be reflected by a broader base of investment. You know, in the past, people wanted to offset the carbon emissions. That, that was the whole point. I think we're going to see money coming in from people who want to help with the education aspects, as I've described for African cookstoves, um, or the health aspects. So, you know, drawing a, a broader base of investment from lots of different areas, not just from people who want to um, offset tons of carbon emissions. Okay. Um, additionally, you know, as, as this voluntary carbon market matures, we will see more forward trading. Um, that's inevitable with the maturing market. You know, as we've seen, it's very much focused on spot at the moment. So issued tons, um, typically issued recently, we'll do a deal now, issued tons, we'll transfer them from your registry account to my registry account, okay, done, pay, pay, everyone's happy. I think as people get a bit more confident, um, there's going to be more 
buying in the future. So forward trades, people um, locking in uh, credits that are gonna come from projects in two years, three years, four years down the line, okay? Um, and you know, ho hopefully a big uh, scenario that will come off will be uh, you know, US offsets. This Californian market at the moment, the potential Californian market, um, you know, could be very good news for the voluntary card market. You know, ironically, it'll cease to be a voluntary card market, but you know, that's another issue. Um, but you know, things like that can really dominate growth in terms of investments in projects, um, uh, eligibility of different uh, standards as well. At the moment, they're, they're locking it down to one standard, but um, you know, I, I don't see that there's enough credits possible to satisfy demand. So that means they might have to open up the Californian scheme to different standards, which then could be a bit of a gold rush in terms of people now trading different standards which will be eligible. So again, that would be very good news and really jumpstart this, uh, this market. That should say muchas gracias. I've learned today, so apologies for that. But, uh, yeah. but, uh, but, but thank you very much for your attention. I'll, I'll sit down and take some questions now. Well, thank you, Gratham, for, for your impressive presentation. May we take a couple of questions, if you have? Hay una pregunta ahí. Tenemos. Y ahí hay otra. Espérate un momentito. A ver cómo. Ahí hay. Y luego aquí hay otra también. Luego. Vale. Um, I was wondering, besides speculation, is there something you can actually do now as a final buyer of the credits? Um, how do you mean? I mean, you can, I mean, the, the market seems to be split in two at the moment. You, you're getting, can, can you hear me? Is this? Yeah. Yep. Um, there's, there's speculative buyers, typically in America, so they're buying credits now because they think um, they can either use them in a compliance market later on or they can get more value for them. The, the other side of the market are what we call sort of pure voluntary buyers, and they're just buying credits to, to retire them. Yeah, so you, you can buy credits now and you can retire them, put them out of use, um, and in effect offset your emissions. Obviously, both, both types of activity in the market. There's another question there. I don't know if you have information about this, but uh, it's just curiosity about an initiative that it's more uh, focus on the end customer, let's call it like this, the people like us who are buying products each day. I saw that uh, companies uh, like British Airways or KLM, they offer the customers when you buy a ticket to offset the, the emissions that your travel is uh, causing yeah. uh, voluntarily. My question is, do you know if uh, this initiative has had a really uh, success or not? And what's the perception from the then customer, it's the people uh, going that direction because at the end, this gives a little bit of a measure of how the general public perceives all these issues. Yeah, um, I, I do know how this, because I, I know the schemes you mean, so you'll, you'll fly with British Airways and they also, they'll say, you know, the, the carbon um, for this flight will be costing actually you know, 10 pounds. Um, you know, if you want to offset that, you know, you have to pay an extra 10 pounds. Do you want to do that? It's a voluntary uh, transaction. Um, the reality is not many people do it. The take-up has been very low, um, is my understanding, and that's through um, broken credits to offset retailers who have the contract to provide um, tons for various companies like British Airways and other companies. Um, yeah, so a, a very disappointing take-up. But you know, I, I don't see that as being you know, that representative of, of the mood of the, of the general public, the individual, the, the man in the street. Um, you know, I, I think a lot of people still uh, do like to offset their emissions. I've offset my emissions. Companies like to offset their emissions. Um, I, I don't think the, the airline route ever really worked, to be honest. It wasn't a, a case of it was very popular and now it stopped. I don't think it was ever really that popular. Not many people have ever really taken up that opportunity to offset their flights. Um, whereas, you know, the, in, in other walks of life, people will do it, but just not through airlines for whatever reason. A mí me gustaría añadir que realmente nosotros <coughs> tenemos un pequeño esquema de venta desde la página web nuestra de Zero Emissions de compensaciones de emisiones y te puedo asegurar que es muy, muy difícil vender emisiones al, al retailer, ¿no? en, en pequeñas unidades. Es muy, muy complicado. 
porque bueno, no, yo creo que no existe todavía la conciencia, sobre todo en el mercado en que nosotros movemos, en el mercado español, de compensar emisiones. ¿no? Eh, sí hemos tenido alguna demanda de empresas. Es verdad que las empresas, como parte de su responsabilidad social corporativa, sí están comenzando a, a, a lanzarse, a compensar emisiones dentro del alcance que ellos ven posible, dentro de sus operaciones, hacen un inventario de emisiones, y algunas empresas, en concreto este año, aparte de nuestra, otras dos empresas, eh, están compensando emisiones que nosotros hemos canalizado. ¿no? Eh, yo creo que es algo que irá creciendo. El problema es que, como todo, pues tiene un coste. ¿no? Y, y, el, y en un, dentro de un entorno de reducción de costes es difícil defender un, una apuesta como esta. ¿no? Pero yo personalmente, que desde hace algo así como seis meses llevo compensando la, no es mucho, pero bueno, eh, llevo las compensando las emisiones de mi coche, eh, le puse una pegatina, no contamino, le, me compré una tonelada de CO2, voy por la mitad más o menos de la tonelada que me la he quemado y, y os digo que mi, mi punto de vista personal es que yo creo que no he tirado el dinero, yo estoy contento con la iniciativa, pienso que re repetiré. ¿Por qué? Bueno, pues mira, porque yo sí soy una persona concienciada en esto y, y me parece útil. Eh, bueno, es útil para mí y es útil para otros, ¿no? Eh, hay mucha gente que a lo mejor piensa que estoy tirando, tirando el dinero, pero yo personalmente me hace sentir bien. ¿Alguna otra pregunta? Um, I was wondering if there is any market um, mechanism that regulates that the price of the carbon credits don't go too low. Uh, in the voluntary carbon market, there isn't. Um, it, it's a completely unregulated market. Um, and as we saw, you know, I mentioned that trade on the CCX, 59.1 million tons at um, 1.7 US cents a ton. You know, but that was the will of the market. So in the voluntary market, there, there's, there's no um, restriction of prices, no floor prices, cap prices. Um, which you might get in compliance markets. En teoría, digamos, todos los mercados de alguna forma también se autorregulan. ¿no? Si hay muchísima demanda, los precios, si hay mucha, mucha oferta, los precios caen, al final habrá menos proyectos que se verifiquen, porque hay que gastar dinero en verificar un proyecto, hay que mandar una serie de personas, hacer una auditoría, si tienen unos costes mínimos por los cuales por debajo de un precio el, estás perdiendo dinero si estás emitiendo un crédito. ¿no? Con lo cual, bueno, pues los precios bajan, eso hará que habrá menos, menos auditorías, con lo cual pues los precios de alguna forma tenderán a una tendencia a, a llegar al, al precio de mercado. ¿no? Pero bueno. Any further question? Allí hay otra. Me again. Um, it seems kind of messy to me that there are so many different standards. So isn't there an initiative to harmonize these standards like in the future and make a uh, common credit? I mean, you're absolutely right. I mean, there are lots and lots of standards. You know, on, that, on that slide, if you remember, which, which was very big and it was very difficult to, to read, there were, I think, 14 standards on it of, you know, probably 30 or so. Um, yes, there are a lot of standards. Um, but, but there's no, again, it, it's, it's a non-regulated market. So there's no, there's no one in charge of it saying, okay, lads, we, we've got 30 standards. We really want to have four, you know. Um, it's, it's never going to happen like that. So it's really through the, um, the, the preferences of, of the, the market dynamic. You know, if, if buyers want VCS red, they're going to go down that route. Um, if other buyers want you know, gold standard credits, that will be popular. Um, you know, w what we will see is more evolution of standards. And I, and I think you know, eventually we will see a consolidation of who, who the main standards are, you know, who's really buying what. And already we can see, and I showed a slide with you know, VCS being very popular, gold standard, CAR. So, you know, even though there are lots and lots of standards, um, typically the, the volumes t tend to be compressed in four or five. Um, but, but equally, there's no guarantee that'll stay in the future. That it, it could again expand to, um, you know, different standards for specific project types. Um, um, but, you know, it might be easier if, if there were just three or four standards. But, you know, no one's in charge of the market. No one can, can dictate what happens apart from the market itself. So for the foreseeable future, I just think we'll see Um, you know, perhaps some consolidation, but really, you know, buyers choosing through their, their buying preferences to buy from a, a certain handful of standards realistically.